Okay, hello everyone. Achlam Sahlan, welcome to the uh, first event of the spring semester from the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University. Um, this is the first in our series this semester uh, in our theme, uh, Palestine Library. And it's a great pleasure to have with us today Karim Rabi, and he will be in conversation with Wasim Khantous talking about his new book, Palestine is Throwing a Party and the Boral World is Invited, Capital and State Building in the West Bank, which has been published very recently by Duke Press. Karim is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. His work focuses on privatization, urban development, and the state building project in the West Bank. He was previously Assistant Professor of Anthropology at American University in Washington, DC, Harper Schmidt Fellow at the University of Chicago, and Marie Curie Fellow Senior Researcher at the University of Oxford, the, the Center on Migration Policy and Society there. Uh, Karim spent 2020 and 2021 on research leave, supported by ACLS, the Winner Gren Foundation and the Graham Foundation for Advancement in the Fine Arts. And he was also a visiting fellow at CUNY's Center for Place, Culture and Politics. Um, and he, uh, he secured his PhD also from CUNY, from the Graduate Center. Um, so welcome, uh, Karim. Wasim Khantous is the Ibrahim Abulugod Fellow at the Center for Palestine Studies here at Columbia University. Wasim completed his PhD in Peace and Development Studies at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden in 2020. In 2021, he was postdoctoral fellow in the Space and Political Agency Research Group, uh, located at the Faculty of Management and Business at the University of Tampere in Finland. And previous to his academic career, he worked in several Palestinian and Israeli human rights organizations, uh, most notably at the Badil Resource Center and Bet Salem. While he's at the Center for Palestine Studies, Wasim is working on his upcoming book, uh, The Rise of the Israeli War Machine, Palestinians Encounters of Spectral Violence, Destructive Velocities, Intensive uh, Elimination. Welcome, uh, Wasim. Okay, so just before we start, a couple of uh, points of admin. If you have questions, please put them to the, our panelists in the Q&A function. Um, and I should also tell you that uh, Karim has generously provided us with a 30% discount code for his book. And so we'll put that in the chat uh, if you want to uh, take advantage of that, uh, that amazing uh, offer. Thank you, uh, Karim. Okay, and with that, I will pass over, uh, pass the virtual mic to uh, Wasim. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, many thanks, Karim, for the opportunity to discuss this eye-opening, inspiring, but also extremely timely and much needed book. Um, before jumping into the discussion, I would like to briefly present my overall impressions of Karim's book, granted your permission, Karim, to start with that. Um, so the book, Palestine is Throwing a Party and the Whole World is Invited, is a solid comprehensive intervention into the intricate political and economic developments that accompanied the making of a Palestinian state in the West Bank since the mid 2000s. It does so by tracking the multiple processes, conditions, and forces that produced the idea to construct a new Palestinian city in the West Bank, Rawabi, and its subsequent materialization in the space. Based on extensive ethnographic work and situated within and aided by a wide range of critical theorizations on the relations between capitalism, politics, and geography, the book narrates a particular story about what Palestinian political economy and state building look like today vis-a-vis -vis Israeli settler colonialism. In the book, Rawabi is used as a site that signifies different changes occurring today in the West Bank. It is a site where ideas about development, investment, class and state formations, land tenure, among others, become visible. In this regard, Rawabi constitutes a micropolitical site that projects insights on broader micropolitical processes while at the same time reshuffling them. However, the story that the book narrates is not straightforward, neither linear, but rather a complex one that tracks different relations between a multitude of actors 
Palestinian authority officials, Palestinian private sector corporations, developers, Palestinians from different classes, Israeli military and government officials, NGOs, international aid and investment funds, among others. While these relations are complex and shifting, the book's story of Rawabi holds a relatively stable thread that goes as the following. The Palestinian private sector, represented in the companies that initiated the construction of Rawabi and supported by international organizations, is, accru is accruing a great political force resembling something like politics as economics. Here, capital accumulation through privatization of larger scale development projects is framed as a national project towards a promise of modernization, stability, and security, despite but also against Israel's colonial rule. This discourse and practice are increasingly appropriated by the Palestinian Authority and becoming its primary political vector directly, both domestically and externally. This rapprochement between the Palestinian public and private sectors signifies a shift where state making is less about sovereignty and overall national development, but rather about jurisdiction that facilitates and frames privatized development projects as national goals and as a way to make the nation. By that, the Palestinian state does not confront Israeli settler colonial rule, but rather seeks motion and change through integration in the political, in the international economy. And sorry, in the international economy and the generation of capital for uh, the Palestinian capitalist class. The ramifications of such shift in the political economy of the West Bank are widespread. They translate into redirecting aid money companies uh, to redirecting aid money to the private sector, the construction of developmental needs as envisaged by private companies and compatible with their interests, increasing foreign investments in the form of long-term loans, neglecting national development in favor of privatized development for the few, weakening the power of state institutions and empowering public-private governance on the local scale, developing certain areas while underdeveloping or not developing at all others, increasing class disparities among the Palestinians and normalizing the relations with Israeli military and um, military regime and business sector in a way that entails political concessions. So those are my impressions, overall impressions of the book, Karim. So perhaps we can start the discussion by you commenting, tell us how you relate to such a summary. Um, so please, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you. I mean, I thought the summary was 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 really wonderful, and I think you gave me, you know, it's nice, it's nice to hear what other people think of your work, what other people think of your work, and sometimes people have a sort of clearer articulation often than than you managed to come to. So thank you for that. Um, I guess first of all, I'll just I'll do my comments now. First of all, I want to thank um, Simone and you, Asim and Brian, for organizing and for talking with me, um, and to everybody who's here attending. Um, I'm pretty delighted to be here. You know, I studied in New York. I've known some people involved with the center for many decades, including some of my closest friends and collaborators in this kind of work. So it really is my pleasure to be here today, although unfortunately on Zoom and not in the city. So the organizers have asked me to speak for 20 minutes or so uh, before opening it up to a conversation, and I'd like to do a few things. First, to tell you a little bit about the book, um, what I did and what I think I was trying to do. Second, I'll read around a bit and introduce you to some of how my approach ended up leading me to where it did. And then I'll talk briefly about what I think my work can contribute right now in a period of both increased struggle in response to various kinds of Israeli violence, as well as increased attention on Palestine. So uh, a, a real quick note, I think everybody wanted to keep this event, you know, uh, concise and casual into an hour or so. So I didn't make a PowerPoint or anything like that or plans to do screen share. I did put up some, um, some a couple images from the book if you want to take a look, it's at uh, Kerim Rabir slash images. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the book. The book is, to me, an ethnography of the political economics of state building in the West Bank. Through a few intertwined case studies, I tried to show how some of the big picture practices are reshaping Palestine by reconfiguring aid in the West, by reconfiguring the West Bank, pardon me, vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And I hope to show how some of these practices, actors, and material consequences are relevant for the future there. I began the book with a discussion of the massive new, new private housing development being constructed north of Ramallah called Rawabi. Now there's been a ton of attention on it since I started this research and certainly in the time between my field work and the book coming out, but I think my work does something a little bit different than the prevailing orientation. I try to use it as a site where a lot of the changes, so the changes to investment, to development, to the forms of the state, to land tenure and so on, are made visible. And I began there and with developers and designers and then moved outwards to interviews with financiers and people from the development apparatus. 
I looked at their studies that elaborate the idea of a housing shortage in Palestine, which is a shortage that the PA developers and aid agencies are helping the private sector to meet. I discussed changes in the idea of state and urban planning in Palestine and how public-private partnerships are remaking the scale of governance there. Now, I explored how Dawabi targets potential buyers based on specific ideas about the land in Palestine and what that might have to do with increased class stratification through new forms of private land holding and legal precedent. Actually, I liked very much the way you, you sort of tied uh, jurisdiction and the goals of privatization together, um, Wasim. Uh, at the same time, I really wanted to listen to potential buyers and to understand their aspirations and how large developments, debt, and new forms of home life fit into them. So I look at jurisdiction and the fights over legal basis for landholding through disputes between the Wabi developers and right-wing Zionist groups. I try to see what it might tell us about the liberal politics and law in the West Bank. Now, I think there are a handful of straightforward and embedded arguments here. I want to use anthropology to talk about the ways that phenomenon at multiple geographical scales have bearing on people's lives. And I tried to, tie to toggle scales and triangulate all these questions. Now, within Palestine studies, there has sometimes been uh, a prevailing orientation towards what Omar Jarbadi Salamanca calls the School of Occupation Studies, and Omar Tezdel calls Greenlineism. And I think what my two Omar friends are identifying is, I think, a, a, a narrowing of analysis and method towards the occupation by first assuming it, and second, towards its present contours and appearances. So when I first started going for research as a diaspora Palestinian, I was interested not only in return, but in, in trying to look outwards. And I, and I struggled to make sense of practices that I saw that aren't resistive in the ways that we might be predisposed to understand them. And I'll return to that in the last bit of my, my comments a little bit. Um, I'm also a person who, like, who cares about cities, uh, about Marx and political economy. And I think you can see all those things sort of toggling between, in the toggling between everyday practices, capital and the state that I'm, I'm sort of attempting. As for the politics of the book, I think it's been really illuminating to see how it's being received. Uh, I think it's gonna look different for different readers. I hope it's read by Palestinians thinking about the state, capital, class stratification, forms of movement. Of course, I'm not alone in working in that mode, but I do think I make a couple of clear contributions there uh, and about seeing capital and context as an object of study in Palestine. And what I mean is that the dynamics of capital and capitalism produce relations and contexts that can be seen historically and projected forward. I think class ought to be, uh, once again, a, a greater part of the analysis. Uh, it, it also ought to be a part of the discussions about the geographies of stratification and movement and unity. And once productive social relations, capital and class are on the table, I think, I hope, there's a basis to move outwards and see what possibilities actually are in Palestine and for interconnected struggles beyond it. So let me introduce you now to a couple of the framing arguments in the book and read a little bit. And let me take a sip of water. Um, one thing I wish I'd been clearer about and that the historian Mezna Kato pushed me on in a recent talk is, of course, being a historian is the periodization. So it should have gone something like this. In 2005 was the Gaza pullout, 2007 was the split and there, you know, there were severe clashes and conflict, and then Fayyad comes to the scene shortly thereafter. And now what I, I, I ought to have done more to emphasize that in the history of simultaneous geographical and political consolidation. Now, none of it was, a new, was new, but there was a renewed emphasis in the West Bank at the expense of Gaza, and that's the context in which stabilization and stability talk were resonant. Um, Mezna also made the point that technocracy was, was not a new current in Palestine, but that maybe Fayyad was a new kind of political figure, a uh, technocrat outside of the PLO, and in a way, some, someone rehabilitating the PA in the West Bank. Uh, so that's the context I found myself in. And now I'll, I'll read some. I first went to the West Bank for research in 2007, overly aware of the geographies of occupation and heavily influenced by work that described extreme fragmentation there. I saw the wall and the checkpoints and was immersed in scholarship that focused on people through the binary between the violence, overt, extreme, pervasive of occupation, and the everyday micropolitics of resistance to it. But I also saw investment, accumulation, and class stratification, and began to wonder about acts that are not obviously resistive or practices framed as resistance that did not appear to be anti-occupation in a familiar way. So I wondered what it might mean that some of the fragmented places in the West Bank seemed to feel distant from the occupation. That year, I started to look at plans for industrial zones in the West Bank for truck-to-truck -truck trade and the infrastructures of an economic peace based on separation between labor in the West Bank and commercial markets elsewhere. But you know, ultimately there was little I could learn about the zones. The idea had moved in and out of favor at various times, but few concrete steps were taken. However, uh, and this is how I sort of intervened into discussions of 
NGOs and, and that whole thing, um, the plans and reports are still productive. And despite lack of progress, they were invoked and the alphabet soup of international aid organizations and governments produced documents about them and they oriented practice, funding, investment, and intervention. Uh, those plans and the fantasy of circumscribed free labor markets told me that inclusion and integration, however unequal and uneven, are just as important to occupation as separation. Now, by 2008, I'd started to try to understand uh, how racialized labor is manipulated through the occupation to benefit Israeli capital, and how structures of inclusion and incorporation map onto and come to define population. On the West Bank side, it seemed crucial to look at what Palestinians are doing to imagine and to continuously produce the idea and reality of Palestine, not simply by measuring the extent to which various projects can be counted as resistance, but by trying to understand what kind of social and political life are emerging uh, around and within relations and common sense of occupation. Now, at that time, Rawabi was just entering public perception and discourse, and although ground would not be broken until spring 2010, it seemed like an ideal place to analyze imaginary and real projects for state and market building, privatization, and social reproduction. Now, of course, it's still an ideal place, even though I should have foreseen the draw for others and the problems of crafting an intervention into a field that very quickly became saturated with opinions, representations, and analysis. So this sort of framed questions of political, economic, and social aspects of stabilization, state building, and market building built on that fantasy of separation. State building in the West Bank comes out of the Oslo period, but its logics do not begin there. It is, I argue, part of a longer term project to stabilize Palestine within Israel and to reconcile contradictory imperatives. First is the overarching Israeli imperative to control the Palestinian territories and to do so with as little labor and capital as possible. Now, the earliest European Zionist settler colonists consciously imagined and produced a land without a people, an idea reiterated in practice and historiography that persists despite all evidence to the contrary. Uh, Jewish colonists knew they had much to gain from a subordinate and exploitable indigenous population, and they subjected Palestinians to their power. Now, Arab Palestinians and European uh, Jewish Zionist colonists share intertwined histories and worlds. And Palestinians and Israelis are separated geographically and physically. They're separated by political formations, like the occupation and otherwise, that necessitate specific forms of state and civilian power and authority. Yet there, of course, can't be an occupied without an occupier. And the massive state structures and institutions that are produced within the occupying state, which is the generational political, racial, legal, military, and economic mechanisms to police the boundary, I think are, are coherent. And they're constituted by and constituted above the settlement, colonization, and occupation of Palestine. So, you know, like Gary Wilder told us, empires are social formations and places, and places. Uh, that is also true of settlement, state building, and occupation. Now, Israelis and Palestinians are bound in place and through occupation by social, political, and economic relations. And one of the implications of state building is the orientation of work and energy towards the assumption that it's possible to build Palestinian markets and institutions separate from Israel. But the context, again, is messily cohesive and I think better understood through wider lens of global political, political economies of settlement, colonialism, and accumulation, rather than through an imaginary of separateness. And so, if capital is the binding, world-making, productive forces instead of institutions and contexts for being, and Palestine is obviously going to be part of it. Uh, the social historians have done admirable work to show that to us. And one thing I wanted to try to do was to understand um, what that looks like projected forward. And here's one place I came down. In the West Bank, the fluid relationships that, ne that neoliberal capital and states have to territories and national markets are not fundamentally at odds with the present conditions of occupation, military rule, and colonial control. Moreover, state and economy building projects work to create stability at the scale of the national economy in the relationship with Israel upward, and they may distribute instability socially downward. Now, as a question of capitalism and neoliberalism, the territorial state was successful until it stopped being so. And capitalism is both crisis prone and resilient. And the ways that it regulates itself and overcomes contradictions are sites for analysis uh, of its persistence and ongoing formation. Now, power there is exercise in general, I think, is exercised as a series of endless patches on a tire, but the wheel keeps moving and unintended consequences continuously appear as both new problems and also for new opportunities for people who are able to take advantage of them. But if I'm really struggling with the specificity of Palestine and the generality of global capital, place became really important for me to work to understand. And Rawabi is a helpful site for analysis because I think it can be a solution to problems from the perspective of capital accumulation and fixity to protect capital from the wider situation. 
It's also a part of tre a trend that, that David Harvey descri described in his discussion of, of the Grundrisse and with me recently when we were talking about, uh, about this book, um, towards fixed capital that is disaggregated from not only production, but also social reproduction. Uh, so I think Rawabi might establish certain ideas in the landscape. It's a node, but also people live there and their conceptions and lives are, or will increasingly be, formed in relation to the, the, that place and new types of places in general. So I'm reading again. Uh, coalitions of actors create new forms of economic life and market participation. They do not simply emerge from nowhere. They can exist in new places like this housing development, for example, where developers influence and cultivate consumers and incorporate participants. At the international scale, aid is being reconfigured as funding for the private sector through the government. And in response to growing privatization and available credit, not to mention decades of exhausting political and social circumstances, consumers are taking on increased debt burdens with the chance to live in the new town. Those loans are backed by international aid organizations, insulating lenders as part of their political imperative to keep Palestine stable. Almost as in aspic, Palestine, the idea of Palestine, the administration of Palestine, Palestinians, is today suspended by and within Israeli political, economic, and geographic imperatives. In many forms of human intervention, international aid and global investment, local projects, and forms of agency work to differentiate Palestine and Israel, yet maintain them as part of the same whole, uh, one in which Palestine is a subordinate state, territory, and market within Israel. Private development as a form of state and economy building is one such project. And that's why, you know, for example, the, the Wabi thing became such a big deal so far in advance of its physical manifestation. Because for different types of actors, interests, and classes, it had already become an idea and a site on which to cultivate new forms of political organization, economic investment, and class aspiration that had previously lacked clear forms or outlets. And although there's a constant movement, the process has a stabilizing function to scale of its relationship with Israel. The Wabi fixes ideas from a specific moment in time on the ground, in the law, and in the polity to organize the structural possibilities for future initiatives and activity. As a mechanism for class stratification and accumulation, private housing, much of it debt financed, is itself a site for international intervention. As such development projects become a national priority for the PA and the donors, they're altering the experiences of those Palestinians inside who are unable to afford to participate or who are otherwise outside of its scope. Plans premised on class aspiration are potentially inclusive, as well as terminally exclusive. And absent the right, for, right of return for Palestinians and return being in this, in this instance contingent on affordability, class is a vector for return, and a primary way diaspora relations to Palestine are uh, sort of being, being shaped. So this, this whole thing, I think, is one, in, one unintended consequence for the nation. Here's another way of putting it that might tie it together a bit. Urban spaces made and remade. The Rawabi process fixes capital at some ports, points in the landscape and destabilizes it at others. And the creation of the new town will reverberate throughout West Bank localities and in terms of current and future relationships between the state and formation and Israel. As land registration and land tenure change, emphasis is placed on individual owners buying and selling land in contrast to historical collective family rights. Uh, as the PA increasingly supports and funds privatization of large blocks of land and private development at a large scale, the likelihood increases that other locales will be underfunded or defunded altogether. Uh, international organizations are giving money to the private sector through the PA, and together, private developers and NGOs contribute to refocus PA priorities, documents drawn up for and by donors increasingly acquire political relevance, and their principles materialize through investment and fixed capital. PA has long been ceding public functions to the private sector, and, and Rawabi was, at least at the early stages, attaching itself explicitly to the state building agenda and rhetoric. So the point here is that I found Rawabi a useful starting place uh, because I think it reconciles ideology, intervention, practice, and people. Now, just let me get to the last part of this uh, and, and talk a little bit about what I think this might have to do with what's going on in Palestine uh, at present. I admit on a personal level, um, it's, it's often hard to talk about, about capital and aspiration and stratification right now. Um, it's sometimes hard to convince myself or others about an approach that tries to move beyond analysis of subjugation and resistance when the biggest story right now and the thing that we all ought to be focusing on is precisely another ebullition in, in Jerusalem or in Gaza and, and, and the more visible and widespread Palestinian unity in response. What I can offer is, I think, a way to situate some of it. Uh, I, was, I recently read around in, in Harsha Walia's new book, 
And she describes borders and bordering as forms of racial capitalist statecraft. I think that starts to get us towards the state dimensions of these questions. Or there's the way Bashir Abumenna put it in a, in a talk in May or June um, with Nadia. The reason that we're seeing resistance inside and in Gaza is precisely because they're not what he called the Oslo territories. So if stabilization is an ongoing set of practices that emerge through Oslo, it also helps to understand the recent visibility of settlers and settler violence inside. And here's how I put it in the book. The practices that surround ideas and representations go a long way in producing stability and orienting ideas and frameworks around future in interventions. In a Middle East characterized by the widespread resistance to autocratic regimes, resistance that has often been inspired by the Palestinian struggle against colonization and Israeli occupation, Ramallah might be, in some ways and for some people, one of the more insulated and stable places in the region. In terms of class aspiration and stability, there are not many places uh, in the West Bank other than Ramallah where a refracted image of normal everyday life is permissible. It's something that, that Ghaib Dakarmi talks really sort of movingly about. Palestine refers to less and less territory and fewer and fewer Palestinians. At the same time, as a target of interventions, it does much more work. Economic interventions orient Palestine towards the, glo the global market. Lisa Taraki is one of the sort of primary people to, to read about that. Uh, and the Palestine of the West Bank stands in for historic Palestine, Gaza, and the diaspora, and comes to limit wider possibilities. As far as Palestinian cities are concerned, Ramallah and its surrounding areas are the primary sites for development as market building, and they exist in a vacuum enabled by the distribution of Israeli state violence elsewhere. Moreover, Ramallah is an idea and a representation that circulates to further these plans and interventions and a place where an image for aspiration and growth as politics. So I think one of the things to, that I sort of kept in mind with all that is that uh, for me, much of the Zionist imperative is, is predicated on erasure, both physical and in terms of making it impossible to live as an indigenous person. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, Patrick Wolf uh, and his discussion of settler colonialism has been taken up in a lot of ham-handed ways. But I think it's one of the things is worth remembering is that he was responding to an argument within genocide studies and proposed eliminationist logic uh, as an alternative, as a way to understand a complex agglomeration of forces operating at the level of uh, the Israeli state and polity. And, and that logic brings with it new contexts and possibilities to disaggregate Palestinians from their land and life worlds, to attach them, to attach them elsewhere, as it also is part of what I, what I sort of mentioned previously, the kind of like the generational institution building. Um, so of course, there are elite Palestinians who are able to benefit within, within that context to accommodate and or to get rich and or to reframe nationalism. And they're not doing it by confrontation, but by presenting an alternative. So I mean, now maybe, you know, the, the, last, the last months, uh, maybe this is the moment that, that all these focused investments in market building and stabilization fail, I don't know. Um, or maybe we'll just see more money plowed in, more accumulation at the top and more instability distributed downwards again, I don't know. Um, but what I hope is that I have, I've done to, what I hope I've done, pardon me, is to show the flip side, some places and forms of life that enable and are enabled by what happens elsewhere. So I, I, I think that's probably been about 20 minutes and I would like to stop speaking and um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karim. So I would like to start by picking up on some of the uh, arguments that you made uh, in your presentation. And let's start with the one when you speak about periodization and contextualization that Mezna mentioned also. Um, so for me, the, the of course, I mean, this whole project, it is tied to the Oslo Accords, but even predating the Oslo Accords, if you speak about economic peace that, you know, the US has been propagating for a long time now, not only in Palestine and Israel, but also between Israel and the region. But, I mean, there were particular events that preceded the Fayyad speech that I would like to take this, that I think if, if we look at them, we could um, uh, have uh, maybe uh, more understanding about what enabled actually the acceleration of this uh, privatization process that you speak about. So basically, you, you mentioned briefly the events, these preceding events, namely the Second Intifada, the siege period, Hamas winning the preceding elections, followed by international boycott, the internal split between Fatah and Hamas, and Fatah's eventual takeover of the Palestinian uh, Legislative Council in the West Bank. So what I wondered whether these latter events have more to offer than a mere background. 
uh, in particular, given the sheer volume of destruction and violence they inflicted and the political configurations that took place during that period, such as the establishment of the Quartet, whose main role is to strengthen the Palestinian economy and achieve stability, and whose head at the time, Tony Blair, and as we know from your book, seemed to be in close connections to the company that constructed Rawadi. That in addition to a massive uh, reorganization of the Palestinian security apparatus, which is crucial for ensuring investment in Palestine. So for me, all of this looks more like uh, it's more than a mere shock doctrine that facilitates privatization. It is an opportunity, uh, opportunity of course, to uh, reconfigure the Palestinian economy and politics in its, in, uh, in its entirety. So what I wonder about is to what extent have you examined the relevance of these events? If so, like what did they reveal? And if not, what do you think they could offer to the arguments that you make in the book? Back to you, Karim. Um, I mean, I think you're right. I, I don't. I think that I think that you have identified something. The reason that that I think Mesna put it to me that way, and that I put it in the talk, is that I think that she and you are right that there is a there's a sort of a longer history to these trends. I mean, I think that what I was trying to do with that little bit of the presentation and that that sort of discussion in the book is to is I, I mean I think we agree right and I think that what I'm trying to do is is to is to to push back on the idea that that all of this is new suddenly there's this new stuff that's happening that has no sort of analog and I think that what you're doing is correct and is you know would be the basis for like a much stronger kind of historical argument and historical articulation than the one the one that I that I made I think that what I was trying to do there was to push back on the sort of like analytical approach that took all this as the newest thing in the world, that it was somehow an imposition on Palestine. I think that like if I sort of if I try to think back a little bit on 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 writing it, that felt pretty that felt really relevant to me. Make the 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 sort of imperative to to make the apart the pardon me the argument that this isn't new and here's why I think this is new, even though that it, there's sort of like investment, literal, but I, I mean, you know, also metaphorical or whatever, um, in making this appear new. So I think, I think you're, I think you're completely right. And I, and I think that what I was trying to do, um, although, uh, again, I, I, maybe not as, as clearly sort of articulate, articulated as it could have been is, is to say that this kind of stuff, this kind of private development is part of the same kind of like it hangs together with the same kinds of things that you're talking about in as like part of this sort of movement towards stabilization or stability or ideas of stabilization and stability. And that maybe one way to sort of think about the wider goals, like at this scale, the scale of Israel and its relationship to the PA or its relationship to territorial Palestine or the West Bank or historical Palestine or whatever, is um, different sort of movement towards stability and stabilization. I think that's also what I had in mind with the, the sort of last bit where I'm kind of um, like vamping a little bit on Patrick Wolf is that yeah. I think that the, that's where the like the logic hangs together. They're sort of like pushing something some places, building things, building things up in other places. I mean, I think that I think the sort of like Stabil relative st stability and security of Ramallah is a, is a direct outcome of the, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of violence and aggression and prerogative that you see elsewhere, you know, and not just the, the sort of open violence. I mean, stability of violence in, in, pardon me, the stability of Ramallah is also a direct outcome of like center of life policies and things like that. I saw, you know, we have, we have somebody on the, on the call Fed who, who does a lot of really uh, smart and wonderful work on this topic. But like, I mean, I think that that's sort of what I was trying to do. Okay, yeah. so I mean, now I'm just swimming around in this, in this, but like yeah, yeah. talk about the sort of no, no. direction. No, no, yeah, definitely. Um, so let's take the point that you raised now, the, the logic of elimination, Patrick Wolf's work uh, further. So basically my second question is about two interconnected points that you raised in, uh, in the book that happened during the negotiation sessions between uh, the PA, the Mossar company representatives, international representatives, and Israeli military and government officials. And those two points 
are the first is when Israel approved the construction of, of the access road that leads to Rawabi and passes in Area C, it approved it only temporarily, making it subject to constant renewal. The second point is that during these negotiations, Israel's approval of, infra of infrastructure, such as uh, the road that we spoke about, were tied to political concessions on the PA part. You referred to one incident in which the PA withdrew uh, its request from, uh, at, for, to become a member of one of the international organizations. So this is the expense paid, uh, the political concessions. So the question here is, could the temporariness of Israeli approvals work as a mechanism to perpetually exhort political concessions from the PA? How does this feed into understanding the ways in which Israel's logic of elimination is operating today? But also, can you tell us more about other examples of political concessions that were uh, made during those negations that you know of? That was the primary one I think that was publicized at the time. It was the, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the WTO, is that right? I'm, I'm blanking a little bit on the details. And, and, and I think that, um, I think that the, I mean, there's some stuff that I heard about anecdotally that I don't know is tr how true it is. So yeah. I didn't put it in the book and I won't talk about it here. Um, but I think that like the, to, to answer a, your question in a way that is possible, I think that there, it's, it's part of the whole sort of process of putting, you know, the demands of private development into this, into the sort of like scale of the state and scale of the, the, the national priority is one thing that I, I talked about a lot in the um, in the book. And and I mean, as far as your 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 argument about the sort of temporariness or constant renewal of the access road, I mean, of course, that's exactly what it is, you know, is exactly about sort of creating some kind of stability that is never actually stable. You know, I mean, that's one of the things that like, you know, the the like with everything in Palestine, I mean, the 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 Israelis have a valve that they can close at any moment. I think in the case of that access road or in the case of the, you know, the checkpoint that's near the housing development, I think it's quite clear that they, you know, they have, they have a valve that they can close. And what you're talking about is exactly like the tension that I hope that I tried to express between like the sort of like massive investment in stabilization, stable infrastructures, huge things, but then the sort of like constant renewal, temporariness, instability of it all. And, and okay, I will get back also if, if, you, if you think about something, how this also could, could project into Israel's elimin eliminatory pr processes or practices or mechanisms uh, in the sense that, I mean, it co-opts at the same time, it constantly, um, uh, so this whole project is constantly dependent on Israel, but at the same time, it allows relative expansion of Palestinians over areas A, of course, we're not speaking about areas A, B or C, definitely. Uh, but at the same time, it constantly, so maybe there's something more to discover about how Israel's uh, logic of elimination actually translates into this mechanism. But let's move forward because- Let me, we just, let me just say, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's expansion. I mean, I think that it's, it is compression, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's like, there's planning rhetoric and architects rhetoric about inwards and upwards as urban vernacular. Yeah. But that's also, I mean, I think a really good description and metaphor for what's happening in, in, in Palestine, the area system, but also like the what's permissible, you know? So it looks like an expansion just because it's huge, but it is, but it is very much- uh, Within the boundaries of the enclave, right? With areas A, yeah. It's, but it's, it's also shift, it's also sort of smushing forms of, I think, potentially, you know, politics, uh, Things like forms of politics and, and sort of forms of aspiration alongside the sort of the real, like place part of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's move on um, to this question. Okay. So in the book, you engage with Palestinians who are part of the targeted group of supposedly middle class Palestinians, which also come to share Rawabi's promise for modernization and security, and were actually like willing to take long term loans to achieve that uh, promise. But then you don't show whether these people manage eventually to buy an apartment in Rawabi, especially given that apartment prices inflated over time. Can you tell us more about that? And if, if actually some of your uh, interviewees actually managed to buy an apartment there and how, how they reflected on these promises later on? I mean, it's a huge open question. I don't know. The answer is I don't know. 
um, the I think that they were important for me to talk about because I wanted to understand how they were sort of articulating their relationship to the place and to time. So one thing that I, I, I wrote about a little bit in that section is, you know, I interviewed a few people, but one guy I, I sort of quote from at length, who really sort of understood taking on uh, a loan as a form of uh, sort of personal stability and aspiration. And I, and I, I found that really surprising because we are talking just after the, you know, the worldwide financial collapse, that crisis, financial crisis that happened um, uh, as a result to a large degree of like questionable loans. And I, and I, and I was, I was really struck that he said things like, you know, taking on a, a 30, it's like a 30 year commitment. It's a 30 year sort of like way to project forward uh, sort of his, 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 mind and his relationship to his his family and stuff like that. I think the flip side of it and like I mean part of it is just like I finished the research. I don't I don't know. You know, that's not a very satisfying answer, but it's an honest one. Yeah. Um, the you know the uh, the other thing is that I think that a lot of this this got stalled. And and I think that the the interesting part of this discussion and of your question to me is like who, who gets left hold it, who, who gets, so if developers are insulated at the top by sort of loan guarantees, by money coming in from, from sort of foreign aid that's scaffolding their project or scaffolding their loans, like what you're seeing is the distribution of instability downwards to these people. You know, let's say the project never gets fully built and people have taken out loans already because they are giving up loans already. Um, what happens to those people and their mortgages? I mean, I think that that it's 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 just the sort of like the process and the sort of con continual distribution of instability downwards was was what I wanted to to try to to show in that section. While at the same time, people are understanding it as potential for stability. You know. Okay. Good. Thanks, Karen. Can I answer your question? Yep. Okay. Definitely. So. Um, because I have many questions and I would like to, you know, go through as much as possible. Um, so in the book, you trace the power of Masar, the company initiated and later on constructed Rawabi as part of a larger global network of investment funds, think tanks or action tanks, NGOs, among others. The Portland Trust uh, in particular seems to be particularly powerful. It played a huge role in constructing the idea of a need for more housing in Palestine which you question in the book, and you provide evidence to that. And later, uh, it facilitates Rawab's approval among the PA and Israel. Can you tell us more about the Portland Trust, about its role in constructing the idea of housing shortages in the West Bank, as well as its relations to Israel and, and the PA? Well, this is one of those things that uh, was also in, sort of like, you really hit a wall when you're trying to, to do research. Mm -hmm. On, on yeah. like this. I mean, I think that what I what I tried to show was that there are sort of uh, narratives or what like what's the word for like comic books? The sort of like first moment, like first story. What, what am I anyway? Um, you know, they're they're sort of like origin stories, origin stories, origin yeah. stories to to the firm and to um, and to the idea of what happened and why you know sort of like a lot of the story of Rawabi is is the, the story of this one guy, Masri. But what I tried to show in that section is like, there are people who were working in this mode, who are trying to think of ways to, um, to do stabilization and to do capital accumulation. And the Portland Trust was one of the main ones as, as sort of like a, an, an investment, like investment think tank basically. And one of the things that they did is they, they as part of the sort of like, they were they were the they they sort of facilitated jump starting the move towards large scale development in Palestine and did a lot of the sort of like thinking behind changes in land tenure forms of investment that could come in um, the sort of like viability of it and the thing that you mentioned is one thing that they did but not just them I mean UN agencies were involved with it PA agencies were involved with it is all these studies that um, of the housing market. That, uh, that make claims that there's a housing shortage in Palestine. And one of the things that I tried to do is to show the, um, is, to, is to look at these, these studies pretty, care, pretty, pretty closely and to say that you know, what they're talking about is a housing shortage for the kind of housing that they can 
give uh, mortgages, give mortgages for and uh, profit from. So like the kind of the specific kind of housing that is part of the sort of jump starting uh, this market and this real estate market and this relationship to 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 privatization and land tenure and stuff like that. I mean, if you wanted to solve a housing shortage, you would just build public housing. You know, I mean, that's yeah. that's, that's that's you know. So so any any housing shortage is is uh, it's a shortage of distribution, right? I mean, that's yeah. obvious to us. That's I mean, like you can angle set it, you know. But I mean, like it's 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 that's that's sort of what I was trying to do with those studies. Yeah. Okay. Good. So this actually connects to the next question. We speak about you know, I mean, the mode of production there seems it's not very productive in the sense it's not very innovative, right? You basically extract the most uh, precious resource, which is land, particularly given the colonial imperative of enclavization of 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 the Palestinians. So I wonder, like, what what can we understand? Like, why? How come? Like, first of all, that such valuable resource. Uh, for all Palestinians uh, become become the main uh, target of extraction, which is land. Um, I don't know, maybe like other long term political social effects that you have in mind when you see such the dominance of such of such um, uh, uh, political economy targeting na uh, land and development and housing rather than actually, you know, instigating the Palestinian economy in more productive ways. I mean, I think that like, you know, one of the things that I tried to do again is is like in the discussion of the of the um, the potential buyers and here too is also try to sort of take it on its own terms and sort of understand what what the you know, I didn't want to just sit here and say like you know these capitalists are just doing some bullshit you know like I mean I wanted to take it on on its own terms and try to see what sort of shakes out. I mean I, I think in this instance like. You know, when they say things like there's a lack of capacity in the PA or there aren't really there aren't really sort of opportunities to do industrial production or something like that. I mean, I think they're right. You know, I, I, I think those are I think those are like accurate statements. Um, I think the, the sort of the, the bigger issue is that, like. You know, there are reasons why you can't bring in raw materials, except for if you're a housing developer, you know, there are reasons why the sort of. Um, you know the kinds of goods that get led into the the circumscribed Palestinian market are often ones that might be feasibly produced there. You know there there yeah. there are things that that you know I, I guess there there are like a, there's a there's a lot of things that make it such that land in A and B is really the only resource that they have available to them. But I mean that's also that's not to like really absolve them because it's also. Um, you can so channel development. Like you can channel development into other sectors. You know, technology, whatever. I mean, it's just. I mean, it's 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 maybe also what what these corporations have the experience and the knowledge and and the tools to actually construct, right? So it's related to their own kind of, um, um, well, the, the 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 work that they used to do before that. Yeah, but I mean, it's just like I think that. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are there are there are, there are people here on this this chat who may um, who may mm -hmm. want to say something about it or not. But I mean, I think that you know there there it doesn't seem like there is much sort of mm -hmm. will or interest or capacity to do like an industrial policy mm -hmm. or something like that in the West Bank. And then also, you know, the if you're you know private real estate developers, I think don't yeah they're private real estate developers. They're not. They're not. You know, the, the public sector, or whatever. Um, I think that uh, the second part of your question was about the the, the potential long term effects of it, and I think that there are, you know, there are sort of like potential transformations that are happening in the in these relationships to the land and stuff like that. Not by sort of like bamboozling people or or, or, or changing their minds or whatever, but like I think that the the sort of like the shifting contexts contexts and sort of like ways of being within them are are are, are real you know mm -hmm. changes in, in sort of like the idea of politics so like a politics of aspiration from capitalists from the pa or whatever like this this the scope of it is real 
you know, the, mm -hmm. the sort of like the, the, the fact that people who have these politics have the capacity to make changes while, you know, like other people don't, I think is real. And, you know, there's, there's in the, in the section when I was talking about buyers and stuff like that, um, there was, there was a guy who was saying like, you know, making, making the, the sort of like the real sort of like Palestinian cultural argument that that's, that, that's part of what you're making, which is like, he's like, how are we going to take this land and turn it into these houses when there's olive trees and all this stuff? And he's like, uh, as he says, like, and Ibn Hattar of Ibn Rawabi, you know, and he says like, you're, you're Karim, you know that you're from Yazur, you know, like this is, and I think that what he's pointing to is he's changing the relationship. He's not changing. He's pointing to the potential changes in, in relationships to the land that, and in this regard, I'm not talking like theoretically or whatever. I'm just like very specifically changing people's relationships to the land by creating sort of new forms of place. And then you can extract upwards and start talking about social reproduction, what that means and so on. And then there you have the answer to your question, which is like social reproduction is the reproduction of everyday life and daily life and human reproduction, but mode of production. Mm. Good. So we have less than 10 minutes. So I have two more questions. I have more, but uh, for now, and then uh, we will uh, continue with the uh, audience's questions. We received one so far, so please uh, send us more. Um, so Karim, it's, I mean, I will make them one this way. So it's one about methods, no, actually there are two. So one is about methods. So I would like to speak a little bit about uh, the method uh, methodological challenges. Um, so in the beginning of, of the book, we see that you had a quite smooth access to the different PA and private sector representatives and employees that gradually, and as the book advances, it narrows down and almost reaching a point of blockage at a certain point. Can you tell us more about the challenges you faced during field work, especially challenges posed when, when crucial public materials or should be public end up in the custody of private companies? I mean, I'm not saying that the PA, I had my own experience with the PA and they weren't that transparent or open. I mean, of course it depends on, on, on many um, criteria, um, but now we have an additional player, which is a private company that actually it has also a lot of power in, 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 uh, uh, in having these materials. So can you just briefly tell us about these challenges and about the censorship part or trying to exclude you? Yeah, so questions about method and questions of access. I mean, one of the things that I did try to do at parts in the book, I mean, it's not the most ethnographic book there is, but you know, I did try to sort of talk a little bit about the research project and a little bit about what I did. I included you know, some things that you know, even made me look kind of foolish um, because I wanted, to make the, I wanted to make the case in, in, in anthropology, but you know, also given sort of my training as both an anthropologist and an urban geographer, um, that you can use ethnography to, you know, to study the ways that phenomena at, at distant scales impact people's lives and people's relationship to sort of, to sort of bigger scale things. And, I, and, and that's sort of what I had in mind in, in my words before when I'm talking about like the toggling and what I was, what I was trying to do. Um, so, I, I mean, I did, I did go see, you know, real estate developers and PA people and, and finance capital people. And what, I mean, maybe I think this might be one of the things you have in mind is there's a strange way in, in, in you know, in Palestine where like you can kind of just go see somebody, you know, some, mm -hmm. see somebody you like, you'd never be able to see a, a like a, you know, a secretary of state in the U S or something like that, but you can go, you can, you can, you can get close to like a minister or something like that in Palestine, you know, and, I, and some people can, can get closer. Or, and I think that like, there's a way that there's, there are things that are open and things that are also closed. And one of the things that I sort of, I quickly start to find out when I talk to all these people is that I was getting the same sort of story over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I, that was, I guess, expected. Um, but also what I tried to do when I realized like that that was going to be one of one of the limits that I faced is I tried to stack them up and then see on the margins what was different between the people. And then you could start to see what's important to, to Wasim and what's important to Kareem and what's important to Brian and what's important to Simone and in the, in the differences between what we're all, what, what people were all saying. And then I started to, to sort of put together the, um, the picture that way. 
I think was one of the was one of was my approach to you know studying up and 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 so on. But also, I mean, again, I did really try to take these people seriously. I didn't, you know, sit down with an oppositional attitude towards people that I might disagree with politically or something like that. I mean, I tried to sort of, I tried to, to take them at their word and then to see what, what, what that was producing, you know? Um, I mean, in the, in, in the interviews and stuff, I have my own opinions and analysis and everything, obviously. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's what I tried to do. And then the censorship, I think you're referring to the sort of like uh, the section where I talk about how I was never able to get uh, an interview with Bashar al-Masri. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, when I was when I did this talk with um, with Mesna and with David Harvey recently, he said that uh, he said what, he said it was like an Agatha Christie novel, which was uh, which was a really I mean, kind of hilarious, but um, <laughs> nice, nice phrase. Um, because I did talk about like how I how I sort of tried to see him, what the sort of attempts looked like, and then ultimately that they finally told me that I wouldn't be able to see him and why, you know, and 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 the why was we don't think he has anything to add, which is obviously is untrue, you know, just in no way possible is that untrue, is that true, and so um, so I I. I but I, I think that, and then I later heard from uh, from a former employee who I don't quote by name, obviously, uh, that you know that they did sort of get skeptical of me and start to decide not to like that they the the idea was that if I didn't talk to Musty, it would like it would destabilize the whole project what I was doing. That's at least what somebody said. Like, oh, if he doesn't have Musty, he doesn't have he doesn't have the work, which. As I say in in the in that chapter, like, well, it's anthropology, everything is data, you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like you, you can't you can't beat our method, <laughs> our regard, you know. So I so I mean I so I did I just wrote about it, you know, and that was actually something that that um, you know when a when a a professor when I was in grad school a million years ago uh, pushed me on is I had a lot of that stuff kind of buried in a previous iteration of this buried in, in footnotes and things and and he was like i think this is actually the story of, of this is like this is an important part yeah. of the story that you need to give more more sort of room to and you're not the only you're not the only person to to bring it up also like i mean i put it in because i thought it helped set the scene for what this kind of research looks like i thought parts of it were funny you know i, I like it. And, and, but but yeah i mean i think that that was that was the goal there um, Cool. Uh, sorry, Karim. Are you done? Uh, sure. Last question before we have yeah, two questions from the audience. Us. So let's hope for one more. Um, so my last question, briefly, for the oh, yeah, well, so for me the book is an acrobatic one. It is interdisciplinary, follows multiplicity of processes and actors, constantly travels across scales. Uh, it is not an easy task, but you did it. You did a really great job in this regard. So my question here is, how did you manage to track all these messiness and still make a coherent, synchronized, and well-balanced uh, analysis? What is the secret? Uh, and But also, um, why didn't you seek help like from existing theoretical framing, such as Deleuze and Guattari's assembly theory or Latour's actor network theory that could facilitate such complex research? Or maybe you did without mentioning that. But we have two minutes, three minutes. You're response. just always gonna want to talk about Deleuze, man. Like, leave him out of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it it reads very Deleuzean to be to, to me your book. To be honest, this whole kind of the, the motion of things coming together, diverging frictions, and so on. It's a very much an assemblage theory to me. But I mean, or, that's interesting. That's or the assemblage theory. lens. I mean, the answer to your first question is like is very brief. Is that that's not up to me. That's up to you or the readers to decide if I manage that. I'm mm -hmm. not entirely, I'm not consistently convinced that I have managed that, but I am grateful that you think so. And I'm grateful that you saw that that was what I was trying to do. Most importantly, I'm grateful that you saw that that was what I was trying to do. Um, I mean, I think that like, I think that it, I think that the, just the, the, the theoretical ground that I'm working within is just a different one. I mean, I was, I was like, I was heavily influenced by, you know, Marxist urban geography and, 
you know, and, and ideas of social reproduction and, and place and, 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 and how to sort of think about an ethnography of, of capital and, and things like that. I mean, that's where like, I didn't, I tried not, I mean, there are sections in the beginning and sections in the end where there's a lot of sort of theoretical stuff, but I, I, I tried to kind of let it breathe a little bit, but if there's, if there's a mode of, how do I say it? If, like if there's a mode of argumentation or something that I'm, I'm, I'm drawing on or that was influencing a lot of the way that I was looking at the relationship between capital and place and human conceptions and stuff like that, it was, it was in that, it was in that mode, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the, the, the Marxist human geography mode. But at the same time, like, I mean, this is one of the things that you start, to, well, not everybody, that I st have started to think the longer that, you know, being a student and a scholar and an academic and a teacher is my job, like the, the longer I, I do that, I mean, just a lot of this stuff is just people trying to answer the same questions, you know? And I think that like, I'm not really interested in, in sort of drawing hard lines between between sort of theoretical schools necessarily. I'm not saying that's what you're doing. But I mean, I think that like the reason that it reads, uh, the reason that those things are visible to you coming from a different sort of approach is because I think that we have the same kinds of concerns, the same kinds yeah. of sort of interests and concerns, especially as Palestinians about Palestine, about what it means to be a Palestinian in Palestine and elsewhere, and what all this other stuff up here has to do with it you know, yeah. politics, state violence, de facto and prerogative violence, you know, all these things, how they all hang together. I mean, I think that we probably have very similar concerns, if not similar words to describe them, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, but I do want to say, like, I think there is, um, especially in, the, uh, in the, the discussion of documents and things like that, I mean, I think I am drawing on, on, um, on work in STS, um, uh, Matthew Hall, the anthropologist, is one of them. Um, I mean, you know, Tim Mitchell and Ferguson and, and other people sort of who have had relationships to Foucault, I think is that that was, a, that work was really helpful in thinking about the movement of documents and things like that for me. Okay, great. So we have two questions from the audience. Um, the first is from Raja Khalidi. Oh, he says, Karim, great to hear you present this. What do you make of the big difference between Rawabi, the dream aspiration of a neoliberal future for a new class formation 10 years ago, and Rawabi, the, uh, the reality today <clears throat> of a failed social project of a new city and the unintended consequence of Palestinians from Israel viewing it as their new city in the West Bank? Does this reflect poor planning and market analysis by its social engineers or simply the law of unintended social consequences? To you, Karim. Thank you, Raja. It's a delight. I wish I could see your face. Um, I'm sorry, I can't. But thank you for the question. Um, you know, well, I haven't been able to go back in forever because uh, I unexpectedly moved jobs and in the pandemic, I had planned to be there all last year and I think I probably would have been better able to answer this question. So I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend like I have a very strong answer for you. Um, does it reflect poor planning or unintended consequences? I mean, I think that one of the things that I tried to do, I think you, you probably would disagree with this, is to talk about like the process of planning or the act of planning rather than the outcome of planning. And so I think that the, the, like, this is just planning, you know, the, there are consequences that are unintended and intended. And I realize that I'm sounding like an academic who's like refusing to make a point, which maybe I'm kind of them being right now. But, um, but I think one of the things that's, one of the things that is interesting, and I think that, that, that you, I'm talking to Neja again, um, saw from the beginning is like, I think you had a pretty clear sense for why you didn't think it would work. And we had, you know, sort of arguments and discussions where I sort of tried to reframe the question and say like, well, this is why it works because it's changing land tenure or it's changing the relationship of aid to the PA or it's doing something in that, in that mode. Um, so, I mean, so I do think actually there's, there's a way that if we, like, if we must talk about sort of success and failure, like, 
I don't think that the plans for like multiple little lobbies that they had sort of thought that they would do, like, you know, when they started planning this project in 2010, like, I don't think that that's realistic. I don't think that that's, that's anywhere close to being the case. But I do think that they have succeeded quite a bit in um, sort of creating precedent for changes in land tenure, for sort of um, chipping at the, the sort of social barriers towards long-term mortgages and bringing in mortgage financing, towards sort of creating new mechanisms for aid to move through the PA, things like that. I mean, I think that those, those are precedents that exist because of and through this project. And I think that they've happened. Karim? Yeah? Uh, can we take two more questions? And we have seven minutes left of six. Uh, can we, uh, shall I read two more questions and then you try to answer both of them? Sure. Okay. So the first is, um, is climate change and environmental sustainability deal with dealt with uh, in the housing development that you studied. Can you talk about the relationship of Rawabi to the overall neoliberal processes of responsabilization already in place in, in Palestine, as in the World Bank project to responsabilize electricity consumers as a means of channeling national aspirations? You've talked about Israel's use of Rawabi access as a valve, but I'm interested uh, in the larger globalization context as well, NGO agenda setting, et cetera. If this makes any sense, I'd like to hear about the changes in. Oh, so the second question um, is that if this makes any sense, I'd like to hear about the changes in family social structures promoted by this kind of investment. Um, I'm thinking about Rawabi and how it's structured to a new kind of family unit and a new way of life and a new and new dreams and so on. And what is the impact of that in the narration of the Palestinian National Project? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you to the- They are anonymous. I don't know who, who sent them. Uh, well, thank you to anonymous participants. Um, is climate change and the environment dealt with? Uh, what does it have to do with other sort of like uh, neoliberalization projects, responsibility mechanisms, like electricity consumption and stuff like that? Um, I think that, I mean, climate change in the environment is dealt with like rhetorically. There's this idea that it's a green city. Um, there's this idea that it's energy efficient and things like that. But I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I say I'm not sure. I mean, I, I mean it. I don't know the answer in any real way. Um, I think that there are, you know, if we sort of move the frame again, there are arguments and counter arguments about like, uh, stewardship of the land. So one of the sort of arguments uh, that Rawabi developers make and sort of um, Israeli uh, critics, especially critics in the, in the settlement nearby make are about the environment and about sort of appropriate stewardship. And I think that's one of the ways that the, the, this, this argument is articulated. But again, it's, that's not, I don't think like dealing with climate change, that's like using the climate as a vector for having a political argument about sort of appropriateness and stewardship of land and the, the sort of race and identity of the people on the land and so on. Um, how is it tied to other sort of like responsibility mechanisms like the electricity stuff and, and you know, maybe the pay cards and things like that? Uh, I think very much tied. I mean, it's the same, it's the same sort of ensemble of actors who are working in these modes, who are sort of doing various attempts to privatize, privatize and individualize and frame their interventions in those ways. So I think it's, it's like very much tied to, um, very much tied to the, the, that sort of like ideological practice, but also in some cases like really specifically to the same international aid organizations are doing things like, you know, helping build a road or give money or, or so on. But as far as like I, what I understand the main question to be like, how is climate change and the environment sort of like dealt with through maybe through this new form of building? I think like not really, you know, um, but it is, it, is a, it is a part of the, it is a part of the rhetoric and it is a part of the sort of like 
you know, way of framing and understanding the appropriateness of the, their intervention for the landscape, if that makes sense. I hope that's not too vague. Um, family, social structures, new family units, new dreams. What does this have to do with the national project? You know, I deal with that pretty specifically and, and narrowly, unfortunately, but when I talk about, um, about land tenure. So one of the things that, that uh, the Wabi developers have done is um, because of the scale of their project, they've created, an, uh, because of the scale of the project and because of aid from the PA for eminent domain, they've created clear title on a huge scale. And that's different from the ways that, um, that families have often sort of collectively held land or held land that's, that's titled, uh, you know, sometimes with maybe uh, natural boundaries and things like that. Um, and it's, 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 it's changing the relationship of like families to homes. It's, and, and explicitly, I mean, the developers are, are trying to articulate a single family model against again, explicitly against like a collective family home sort of growth upwards model. Um, and I think that that, I mean, the, the ideas, again, like do, I mean, they, 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 it's a context, I don't think it's like changing people's dreams necessarily, but it's a context that's allowing people to have different forms of aspiration. So like context and aspiration, I think are really important. To, uh, to what I was trying to do there. Okay, Karim. Um, well, we have two minutes left. Uh, okay, so we can finish the session with a comment by Lisa Anderson, who says that there's an interesting regional story about this kind of new government authorized or sponsored for profit that is based on private investment, new cities, see Egypt, see Saudi Arabia, etc. for another webinar. A, a, com a comparative discussion. Okay, uh, so this is an invitation for another seminar on uh, these kind of uh, cities. And I think we should be closing now. Many thanks, Karim, for your time. I will, um, Brian, the floor is yours. Th uh, thanks for the audience, thanks for everybody. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Karim. Thank you, Wasim, uh, for a stimulating discussion. Thanks to everyone for all your questions. Great to see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the list, or familiar names in the list, um, and also wonderful to see uh, a lot of new names there too. Um, the next event in our Palestine Library Book Talk series will be on February 14th at 1 p.m. New York time with David Lloyd talking with Nadim Rwana and Nadara Shalhoub Kevokian about their recent book, When Politics Are Sacralized, Comparative Perspectives on Religious Claims and Nationalism. And uh, my co-director, Nadia abol will be the moderator on that day. Before you go, just to remind you, 30% discount in the chat if you want to avail yourselves of that generous offer from, uh, from Karim. Uh, so on behalf of CPS, thank you for coming, Karim, Wasim, and uh, also to Simone, our uh, administrator. Thank you so much 